I invite you to turn your Bibles to Job 31. This is the text for this morning's message. I hope you were able to acquire an outline uh, at the table on your way in this morning. It will prove helpful to you as you engage this chapter of Scripture. And that is what you came here for, isn't it? Not to hear interesting stories from the, from the Internet, retranslated from a, from a man. But you've come to hear the Word of God. You've come to engage the text. This is Job's, says in the ESV, his final appeal. Actually, it's Job's covenant contract. He already said and claimed he was righteous. Now he's going to heap upon that claim this confirmation of a covenant with his own signature added to it. Let's follow along now. Chapter 31. I've made a covenant, or I've cut a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does not he see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes, if any spot has stuck to my hands, then let me sow and another eat and let what grows from me be rooted up. If my heart has been enticed toward a woman and I have lain in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down on her. For that would be a heinous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For that would be a fire that consumes as far as Abaddon and it would burn to the root all my increase. If I have rejected the cause of my manservant or my maidservant, when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? Did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld anything that the poor desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it, for from my youth the fatherless grew up, with me as with a father. And from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or the needy without covering, if his body has not blessed me and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from the shoulder and let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have faced his majesty. If I have made gold my trust, or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant, or because my hand had found much, if I have looked at the sun when it shone, or, or the moon moving in splendor, and my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for it have been false to God above. If I have rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me or exalted when evil overtook him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. If the men of my tent have not said, Who is there that has been filled with his meat? The sojourner is not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do, my hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me, so that I kept silence, did not go out of doors. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. 
Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. My land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together. If I've eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Let us pray. Indeed, Holy Father, we do pray for the illuminating work of thy Holy Spirit now. We might gain insight into thy word. And we might more deeply and richly know Jesus Christ, whom this suffering man of innocence prefigured. But we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we look at this book of Job, we ask ourselves a question What is this book about? It's about the. It's about a righteous man who suffered as though he was a wicked man. That's the incongruence, the irony of the book. Why is this righteous man suffering so severely? We found that the reason, unbeknownst to Job, was that Satan himself was testing him. God said, look at my servant Job. Here's the one bright, shining light in your dark kingdom, Satan. What do you think of him? And so Satan started turning up the heat at God's permission. Took away his children. Took away his livestock. Job blessed God. Took away his health. Job blessed God. Two massive trials would have leveled anyone and thrown them into disbelief. But he stood firm. But then half the book, chapters 4 up around chapter 27, we have a cycle of Job's inquisition. Three friends. Three neuthetic counselors gone to seed. Three friends turn prosecuting attorneys, putting Job on the spit and turning him over and poking and prodding every square inch. Certainly, at some point, Job, you've sinned. We'll help you find it. By the time we come to chapter 26... Remember Bildad? It's the shortest speech of the three friends. It's the last. He sputters out this. Certainly, uh, uh, this will help you to see that you've sinned. I mean, I mean, if the angels in heaven uh, uh, blush before God, certainly man, that worm, that born of a woman man, uh, has material to work with to make a confession of sin. Remember Job's sarcastic response to that final attempt. Job essentially said to his three, three friends with regard to their wise counsel, you're about as useful as a hare in a biscuit. That's about how useful you are to me. Of course, his sarcasm was more dripping than that. Proverbial sophomores they were. Purveyors of wisdom who were actually morons, unable to unravel and penetrate Job's situation. Defective theology they brought to the task. And then in chapter 27, remember, Job digs in, digs in with his final retort, his final statement. He'd been saying all along, verses 5 and 6, Far be it from me that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness. I will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Chapter 28, then, 
Job is the center of Job, th th this book of Job. It's a little poem, a little soliloquy on, on wisdom. Where can it be found? Of course, that's what Job is asking throughout the entirety of the book. Where do we find wisdom to sort out what's happening here? Chapter 28, then, is that central note of the literary structure of this book. And then in 29, Job picks back up and he talks about, in chapter 29, his old life. <clears throat> chapter 29, he talks about how great things, he looks back and he thinks how wonderful it was. 29, verse 2 says, Oh, that I was, it were, oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through the darkness, as I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent. He thinks back of how it used to be between him and God. Verse 21, he says, men listened to me and I, I waited and kept silence for my counsel. They waited and kept silence for my counsel. So he was an important, an important person of influence and counsel. I spoke, they did not speak again. My word dropped upon them. And they waited for me as for the rain. They opened their mouths as for the spring rain. I smiled on them when they had no confidence in the light of my face. They did not cast down. That was how life used to be with God and man. And then in chapter 30, Job says, now, now look at it. <laughs> verse 30, verse, chapter 30, verse 1. Now what? Now they're not listening and soaking in everything. Now they laugh at me. Even men who are younger than me. It says in verse 9, Now I've become their song. I'm a byword to them. Verse 15 and 16, he says, Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind. My prosperity has passed away like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. See, 28 and 29, Job says, here's how it was. But now here is how it is. In total contrast. And so in verses 30 and 31 of chapter 30, says, my skin turns black and falls from me. My bones burn with heat. And in verse 31, he summarizes what he's just been saying in 29 and 30, chapters 29 and 30. His my lyre, my lyre, that is a musical instrument, like a flute, is, is turned to mourning. And my pipe to the voice of those who weep. Used to be music, now it's weeping. Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> What's happened? <laughs> well, his friends knew. They, they, they knew what happened. Somewhere along the line, Job, you sinned. <laughs> and if you'll just come on, cough it up, uh, repent, and the Lord will uh, restore you. But Job says, I have not. And so in chapter 31, after Job insisting over and over and over as he is brought into a proverbial courtroom with repeated machine gun prosecuting attorneys, he now comes to chapter 31. And Job calls to the stand his star witness, himself. He brings himself to the stand and he places himself under a series, twice, of oaths of self maldiction if in any way my righteousness does not hold. Did so you guys are saying it's, I'm all wrong? Okay. Circumstantial evidence says beyond reasonable doubt you're guilty. Here I am on the ash heap. Here I am trashed. Circumstantial evidence is against me. But now I bring to the to the circle, I bring 
into the dock. This covenant oath. So we find here in verse 1, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Now, this is frequently lifted out as an individual text and why we should not lust, and that's fine. But actually, this is applicable to the, 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 the chapter. Job is saying, I am cutting a covenant. I'm covenanting a covenant with appropriate curses if I have violated that covenant in any way. So Job brings forward this covenant. And it's interesting how Job understands that the integrity of righteousness is just not external. There's no Pharisee here. He talks about his eyes. He's talking about what's going on in his heart as part and parcel of the integrity of his righteousness. I've made a covenant with my eyes. How could I gaze at a virgin? Reminds you of Matthew 5, doesn't it? To look on a woman with lust. Job understood that back then. It was wrong. What would be my portion from the God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? What would happen if that was the case? For calamities for the unrighteous, disaster for the workers of iniquity. Does not he see my ways, number all my steps? Does not he know my life and what I've been doing, his steps, his walk in life? So at the end, in a way you might say it's like a bookended fashion, verses 37 through 40, I would give him an account of all my steps. He says, I'll I'll give an account of God of all my steps, of, of my entirety of my life, from the day I stepped out of the womb until now. If my land has cried out, if its furrows have wept, if I've eaten its yield without payment, in other words, I had workers, I didn't pay them, I burned them, I ripped them off. I made its owners breathe their last because they couldn't eat and feed their families, they died because of me. Then let thorns grow. There's the curse sanction. If such, then let thorns grow. Instead of wheat, foul weeds, a curse in my own land. So Job is, as it is, cutting a covenant of works based upon his own righteousness to appeal for God's approval or God's judgment and cursing. And as Job speaks of covenant, cutting that covenant in verse 1, he then gives a list of oaths of self maldiction Kind of an if then. If I've done this, then let me get that. Now in verses 5 through 8 is kind of the general sense. If I've walked with falsehood, there that is a step. My foot has hastened to deceit. Let me be weighed in a just balance. Let God know my integrity. He's saying this before God. If my step has turned aside from the way, if my heart has gone after my eyes, if any spot has stuck to my hands, the tiniest spot, what does he say? Then... Let me sow and another eat. And that next line, the the note in the ESV is better than what they actually put in there. Uh, Let my descendants be rooted out. You see what what he's saying there. He says, "If, if I've departed, let my crops and my kids fail and all be rooted out. That's this oath of self maldiction There's the general covenant of works if Job's righteousness should fail. Then he proceeds. He goes from crops and kids to his companion. If my heart has been enticed toward a woman, if I've lain in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, let others bow down on her euphemistic language for infidelity. 
But that would be a heinous crime if he broke his covenant with his wife. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. Now, uh, Job identifies himself with those who sit at the gate. It was at the gate of the cities in the ancient Near Eastern world where the, where, where the elders would gather and render judgments on various crimes, render judgments on various difficulties involved in that city of correction. Job enjoyed sitting there. He enjoyed a place of status where everyone would listen to him in the past. And he understands that if he would be unfaithful to his covenant, to the covenant with his wife, that the judges should rightly punish him for. That'd be a fire that consumed as far as Abaddon. It would burn and root up all my increase. In other words, my household, if I would violate that marital covenant, my household would suffer and be toast because of it. And of course, we all know that if we're acquainted with the consequences of adultery. Job then moves on from the immediate family with regard to these oaths of self-maldiction uh, in verses 13 through 15 to his extended family. Notice verse 13. If I have rejected the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they brought a complaint against me, in other words, here's the servants in his household. If they come, he says, if I've not listened to a complaint that they bring, if that's happened, if I've rejected their cause, what shall I do when God rises up? When he makes, when God makes inquiry, what shall I answer with? Now, now, verse 15, look, this is a, an amazing verse. This is all the way back in the book of Job now. Look what he says about his slaves. His, his household servants. Did not he who made me in the womb make him? Job is testifying to the full humanity and integrity and equality of his household servants. Did not he who made me make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? We both came from the womb. We were fashioned in the womb. There's no uh, magical transition from out the womb and in the womb here. That's humanity on both sides. All the way back to Job. He says, if I've mistreated those household servants, if I've done it, May I be rightly judged for it. Job moves from his family to his extended family, now to broken families. If I've withheld anything that the poor desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the fatherless has not eaten of it. And, you know, James chapter 1 says, pure and undefiled religion is to help orphans and widows in their distress. Job says, look, that's been my life. If I failed... The orphan or the widow. And of course, the elders in the gates had a responsibility to help out the orphan and the widow in administering mercy and justice in the city. From my youth, the fatherless grew up with me as with a father. From my mother's womb, I guided the widows. My whole life, Job is saying, I've been aware of caring for the disenfranchised, those who have been broken out from the stability of a family that's complete, widows and orphans. If I've seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing and on, he goes. Verse 21, if I've raised my hand against the fatherless because I saw my help in the gate, you hear what he's saying there? <laughs> If I've raised up my hand against the father, it's because some of the other elders in the gate didn't like him, and I joined in and didn't like him too. What's he saying? May I be cursed? <laughs> He's taking off a self-maldiction. If everybody else was against this one kid because he stole an apple in the market, I'm going to defend him. That's what James is, that's what Job is saying here. If I've raised up my hand against the father, it's because I had saw my help in the gate. 
Then, there's the, there's the, there's the malediction. Then, may my shoulder blade fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be broken from its socket. Just like the orphan and the widow were broken out of normal family, social settings of comfort, protection, so may Job. May be broken apart. And this is almost as it is referring back to the way he, a covenant was cut then with animals as they were broken apart. They're cut apart. Saying that if you don't keep this covenant, may you be broken apart. May you be cut in half. And then verse 23, Job says, this is why, this is why. For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could not have faced his majesty. Job rightly feared the fact that God would judge those who break covenant with him. And he knew he could not face God's majesty as a covenant violator. Then again, Job launches another series of oaths of self maldiction These oaths are cut in half. We just saw the first series, verse 23, the motivation for keeping covenant, the fact that you're going to be called to account before God, verse 23. And now he gives another series of oaths. They're cut in half. Just like the animal was cut in half to cut a covenant. So Job is cutting in half these oaths of self maldiction one side and the other. And Job is saying his steps are ordered according to fidelity. In the old covenant world, when the animal sacrifices were laid out, those who were taking the oath upon themselves would walk up and down. Would, between these animal sacrifices. So Job is talking about his steps as he lines up on each side, these series, these two series of oaths that are, as it is, peering in upon his steps to see if indeed they are fully, truly righteous. And again, Job now turns, if I've made gold my trust, if I've Rejoiced at my wealth. If I've looked at the sun when it shone, or the moon, and my heart, again, there's the heart. This isn't just externalism. My heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand. That is, I've kissed a, 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 an allegiance, an affection uh, toward the sun and moon as if they were God. Or my gold, as if that was more important to me than God. These are sins of idolatry, Job is saying. In my, all the way to my heart, Job is saying. Idolatry has not mastered me. That would be an iniquity punished by the judges. Same thing. That would be, that'd be covenant violation to God punished by the judges. Just like covenant violation against my wife would be punished by the judges. The two ideas are brought together here. For I would have been false to God above. Job goes on about being tempted to curse those who are his enemy. Or failing to feed and be hospitable toward the sojourner. It says, if I concealed my transgressions, and again, the NIV, I don't know what all the other translations are, but the NIV has a side note which really should be in the text as Adam did. If I concealed my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. See, Job is in contrast to Adam in his, his covenant violation and his hiding of his sin as he ran into the trees of the garden. Job says, if, I, if that's the course I've taken, Then, of course, then what? Then as he concludes this other side of these so oaths of self-maldiction, let the thorns grow up. That's what happened to Adam, isn't it? The curse of the thorns. May, may, may the thorns grow up. Foul weeds instead of weed and barn. This land. The land is part and parcel of life. The, the land would bear witness to the covenant relationship. 
the land would bear up. You might ask yourself, what is he doing? <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> I mean, he's been insisting for chapters, and we've seen in chapter 27 his, his insistence upon his own righteousness. But what? He's speaking into deaf ears. All evidence is against you, Job. La, 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 la. He says, okay. And let me take oaths of self maldiction I have covered covenant. And let me take the oath if my righteousness does not hold. This is noose in the neck. This is head on the chopping block. And he does not stop there. Job adds to these oaths of self-maldiction his own signature. Verse 35. Here is my signature, my mark that I make to, to this covenant document of these oaths of self-maldiction. The contract is inked by yours truly. I'm serious. My name is on. Let the Almighty answer me. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. See what he's saying there? He's saying, here's my document. Job's saying, here it is. Here's the oaths. Here's my signature. My righteousness. May these curses fall upon me. And he says, now, may my adversary bring his document. May he bring the list of indictments, of covenant infractions. May he bring it to me now. May my adversary. See, that's, that's how that was of old, before God was called his friend. He was a friend of God. But now God was his adversary. It drawn up against him. May my adversary bring his indictment in like fashion, written, see? And if he would, what does Job say you'd do with it? If my adversary, God Almighty, brings his indictment to the other side of my covenant contract that I've inked, may his indictment sheet, his rap sheet on my life, what will I do with it? Look what he says he does. I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps and like a prince I would approach him. So he said, he said I'd take that paperwork, I'd put it on as a robe and a crown and I'd walk into God's presence as a royal prince with those indictments all over me and ask him to look at my steps. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard that Job is a manual if you're suffering. Do you want to go down there? Do you want to go down there? You want to track with Job here? Not me. Not me. This is it. This is breathtaking. This is breathtaking. Wear them as a robe and a crown like a royal prince to proudly walk into God's palace. Saying, now where does all this stick? Where does any of this stick? The friends had said, you're... Suffering is proof that God has a rap sheet on you, Job. And Job says, okay, it's not true. And now, now let me add to my words this covenant contract with oaths of self maldiction this covenant of works that my righteousness will sustain in God's courtroom. What are we to make of this? Have you heard this before? Oh, yeah, I've heard of this all of this. Heard of this all before. Yeah. It's old hat. No, we haven't. We haven't, have you? That's in Job. He talks like that. He got away with that. I could never talk like that. Where's the door? 
We're some trees to go hide behind when you need them. Brothers and sisters, Job is not a manual on how to suffer. <laughs> Job is the suffering of a righteous man that's looking forward to another man who suffered and entered glory. Job is not primarily about you. Job is about fire-tested righteousness. A righteousness that is needed to defeat Satan. A righteousness required to enter glory. Are you ready to sign off on your own righteousness? Safely wear God's indictments into his presence. Jesus told us that the Old Testament was about him. Job's about Jesus, his suffering and his glory. It's not a manual on how to endure suffering primarily. It's a story of fire-tested righteousness pointing to Jesus Christ who crushed Satan and captured glory. Will righteousness stand burnished and brightened to perfection through suffering? That's the question. Or will it rather reveal through the fire that underneath this Wax is just another rank and file sinner who loves himself like Adam, fit for the furnace. Will your righteousness stand the test? Or will you sin under unjust and mysterious suffering? Will the heat melt that glue holding your life together and will it just go to pieces? You see, Job's severe suffering is, is black and white etchings anticipating the living color of the coming, true, spotless, righteous one, Jesus Christ. In John's Gospel, Jesus said, I always do the things pleasing to him. Which of you convict me of sin? Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples in the upper room, the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do the commandments of my Father. There is no point of entry for a single claw of Satan in the Lord Jesus Christ, for his armor of righteousness had no chink. He was truly the Holy One. as Job is anticipating Christ. And in Christ's last act of obedience on the cross, Satan, Jesus said, would be cast out. Just like as we find in the book of Job with that great dragon, Leviathan, rooted deeply into the creation, can only be defeated by perfect righteousness, the righteousness of a weak and frail man of the dust. What irony. Because of his own righteousness, Jesus Christ would crush the serpent. He would crush the head of the dragon, and he would capture glory. In John's Gospel, it's interesting, there are three men that interrogate Jesus. Annas, Caiaphas, and Pilate. And at the end of the series of interrogations, Pilate concludes, I find no guilt in him. Job was indeed confident of his righteousness, so much so that he could wear heaven's indictments as a robe and crown of glory and strut right into God's palace with it. <laughs> and like the conclusion of Job's story, the conclusion of Christ's earthly life finds him 
back to back, back to back, on one hand, clothed in righteousness, and on another hand, clothed with heaven's indictments. You see, Christ does wear and accept the guilty verdict. He wears the blood-soaked robe. He wears the crown of the cursed thorns. Christ wears the robe and the crown of self maldiction He bears the curse. He bears the curse of heaven indictments against our sins, though he is innocent. This guilty prince of royalty is paraded up the road, up the hill, up unto the cross, up onto his throne of righteousness displayed. Paul tells us in Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, this remarkable thing. That having to do with the death of Jesus Christ, he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. <clears throat> On the cross was nailed the document of heaven's indictments, the record of our debt, which stood against us. And in being nailed to that cross, it was taken away. Job was confident he could wear heaven's indictments. He was confident he could wear heaven's indictments because they didn't apply to him. He was righteous. But here's the rub. Jesus, though righteous, though truly the perfect, spotless, righteous one, took our indictments. And he bears the curse and the bloody robe and the thorn that made a crown. And Jesus walks into the palace of the Holy God. See, the book of Job is an Old Testament story whose banner says, Fire tested righteousness required. That's what Job says. You should read through Job and says, there is no doubt about it. Righteousness is required. Fire-tested righteousness. And the wonder of it all is in the New Testament, we have fire-tested righteousness achieved by Jesus Christ. So do you want to pass through the fire of God's judgment? You want to defeat this, the devil and enter heaven in eternal glory? Do you long for that? Do you wish you could? Then look to Christ. Here alone, forgiveness has been nailed. Here alone, righteousness has been finished. For Christ, the righteous one, Christ, the righteous one, he wears the robe and the crown. He wears our indictments right into the judgment fires. And why does this innocent, innocent one, why does this innocent, righteous, spotless Lamb of God suffer for you, for your forgiveness, for your righteousness, to crush Satan and to capture glory? You see, this kind of righteousness that Jesus Christ gives to you on the ground of his perfect righteousness. It's amazingly different from Job. There's no painful interrogation by ruthless moral prosecutors that you must pass through. There's no quota of suffering that you must meet. There's no covenant of works with oaths of self maldiction that you must say, okay, I'm serious, I'll take it. 
One oath piled on top of the other. <laughs> There's no shaky hand you have to bring to the document and sign your name to it. Everything changes at the cross. Just a happy, serene trust in Jesus Christ who shed his blood for your forgiveness, who lived a spotless life to give you his documented righteousness. So come to the cross by faith alone in Christ alone. Sign your name here. Receive his verdict. Wear his robe of righteousness. Be crowned with his life. When I stand before his throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, then, Lord, will I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Let us pray.